So, hello everyone. Uh, today is the last day of conference and this is after lunch talk. You guys are still here, so you must be real geeks. <laughs> <laughs> so, little disclaimer about me. Uh, this is my first attempt to be a con conference speaker. Uh, so, I might fumble in between. So, just bear with me a little. Um, before jumping to the talk, a little bit about me and my company. So my name is Pratik. I'm a software engineer at Loft Labs. Uh, from my accent, most of you must have uh, guessed I'm from India. But the company is based in USA and I work remotely from India. Uh, if you like to talk or interested in technology I work on or just for a casual conversation, you can ping me on my social handles shown up here. So at Loft Labs, we work at bunch of uh, technologies. And Loft is our commercial project. Uh, it enables large companies to provide self-service isolated namespace to large numbers of teams or developers. At Loft, we work at bunch of open source projects and our, old, our oldest project is DevSpace, uh, which lets you develop an application directly inside the Kubernetes. It is essentially a replacement for a Docker Compose. Uh, then, then there's a kiosk, which is a multi-tenancy extension for Kubernetes. Then JS policy, it is a policy engine that lets you write a Kubernetes policy into JavaScript and TypeScript. And then there is a V cluster, which we are here today to discuss. Uh, before I start with V cluster, I'll try to establish some context. I assume everyone attending here knows Kubernetes. If not, then maybe you can have your post lunch siesta. Just kidding, don't sleep here. So if not, uh, for those who are new uh, to the Kubernetes or getting just started, so this definition will make a little sense. Uh, when I started working on Kubernetes, this does not make any sense to me. So, uh, <laughs> so, so someone I was working with told me Kubernetes is just a manager, uh, which control, uh, container manager, which controls and governs the overall working and life cycle of a containers and then as I started working more and more in Kubernetes this definition started making little by little sense to me. And nowadays one of the hot topic around Kubernetes is multi-tenancy. So I'll try to explain it with uh, what is it and why should we care about it as simply as I could. So as the name suggests multi-tenancy is something related to more than uh, one tenants basically it means to share a cluster between multiple teams or multiple customers uh, but then why should we care about it right uh, so creating a single tenant cluster is quite expensive so when you use a multiple tenant cluster it saves a uh, cost it also simplifies administration just imagine if someone is creating thousand single uh, tenant clusters and now the overhead to manage this uh, thousand cluster is very high. And if you also got to manage, maintain the ingress controller, the cert manager, Prometheus and other metrics uh, controller in all of this cluster, then it's a bit of a lot of work to manage everything. So this is the diagram from the Kubernetes talk. It shows how the multi-team uh, tenancy and multi-customer architecture is. And Achieving a stable multi-tenant cluster also poses some challenges. So one of the major challenges is security. So it's like defining what type of access to be given to what type of tenants. And then the isolation uh, is a big challenge as well. So as we go deep in this area, we'll see many other challenges. Mm. So by default, Kubernetes provides us with the namespaces, which is uh, to handle the multi-tenancy. We can set up the network policies, limit ranges, resource, uh, resource quotas and other things to lock down and isolate the tenants. But what if some tenants needs to access cluster wide resources like someone needs to work with the CRD, then you would have to give them a, a admin access and what if those uh, tenants with admin access breaks down the cluster, then you will have to spin up a new and this could cause issue with the other uh, users as well. So you can see there is a lot of work and overhead uh, uh, when we use a namespace-based multi-tenancy. Uh, 
So is there a pragmatic or is there a middle solution for this? If you notice the diagram, uh, the pros and cons of both the approaches are opposite on the both the side. Uh, like isolation is very weak in namespace, but the separate cluster is very expensive, right? So the pros and cons are on opposite side. So with the weak cluster, we are exactly trying to achieve this. It tries to give you benefits of separate cluster at the cost of the namespace. If you see the diagram again, weak cluster tries to achieve the middle ground. The isolation in weak cluster is stronger than the namespace, whereas the weak cluster is cheaper than the separate cluster. So what is weak cluster then? The weak cluster or virtual cluster is a Kubernetes distribution that runs on top of the another Kubernetes cluster. It has its own control plane, so no two tenants will interact with the same API server or with the host API server. It is lightweight and compared to the full-fledged cluster, it takes very little time to provision. So like virtual machines, uh, cluster, virtual cluster partition host cluster into multiple logical clusters. So I have small demo here and start itself. Uh, okay. So we cluster is a small CLI. I have already downloaded it, and uh, uh, when you do uh, list command, shows you to the shows you the we cluster present in your clusters. To create the we cluster, you just have to do we cluster create, and the uh, virtual cluster name. And I'm providing connect equal to false because I don't want to connect to we cluster by default. So if you do now, uh, if you get the namespace in host cluster, it has created a vcluster vc1 namespace. And in that namespace, we have our virtual cluster up and running. So now we'll connect to that uh, vcluster. Uh, we can see it's running. And we'll use connect command to uh, access the virtual cluster there. It's a bit slow, sorry. <laughs> so it's essentially stopping a Docker proxy and starting a new proxy container in the back end. So now when I do a kget namespace, then you can see the new namespaces arise there. The age is just a 40 second, which means it has just created and the namespace on the right hand side and the left hand side are different. So you can essentially see the difference you are in the uh, separate cluster. So when you do a kget pod siphon cube uh, system, if you are the admin of virtual cluster, so you can get pod in that namespace. If you are not, then you, uh, in the host names uh, host cluster, you may not be admin, so you won't be able to get it. Okay. <coughs> so then, how does this work exactly? You guys are here for this. <laughs> how Kubernetes inside Kubernetes is working. So basically a virtual cluster is a control plane running inside another Kubernetes cluster. So as we know, a control plane is API server, data store, control manager, and a scheduler, which governs the workloads which are running in the namespace. There can be multiple namespaces as there. So as a user, we can only interact with the API server so what we cluster does is it spins an API server and some other components in pods in namespace. So we are running their control plane as a pod and the user will connect to the API server which is running inside that pod. So what does this mean by architecture perspective? So we cluster is mainly has two components. One is a we cluster stateful state, uh, stateful state and another is a we cluster service. The stateful set creates a pod where virtual cluster lives in. It has uh, the two containers. The first one is a control plane, which has API server plus control manager and data store. And another one is a sinker. And this control plane is certified Kubernetes uh, distribution. So it has passed all the conformance tests and exactly work as the any regular Kubernetes cluster. So whenever the user uh, interacts with the uh, API server, it interacts uh, via the vCluster service, which is a service created in the host namespace and it's a Kubernetes service, so you can expose it using ingress or load balancer. Uh, 
so let's look how we can create the workload uh, in the virtual cluster. So we have the host namespace, uh, there are, uh, our vCluster is running in it. Uh, we have our vCluster stateful set and everything is running. So now when we do a kubectl create, create a namespace and S1, so it creates the namespace in vCluster. So namespace is just an entry in the data store, it doesn't have any physical entity. So it uh, creates, uh, the data store could be anything. You, uh, the, we use SQLite by default because it is very light, but it's uh, uh, configurable. So you can use HCD or any other if you like. It creates the namespace and then how, then let's try to create a deployment in it. So when we do kubectl create deployment uh, of Nginx, uh, it, uh, in similar way, it first creates the entry in the data store and then it creates the pod in the same namespace. But if you have noticed, we do not have any scheduler in V cluster. Uh, we just have API server, controller manager, data store, but no scheduler. So then how the pods are getting scheduled? So if you see there is a strange, uh, another component called Singer, Sinker, sorry, Sinker. So what Sinker essentially does is it copies the uh, manifest it copies the pods created and the data entry to the host cluster namespace. So when it copies it create uh, and when the copy is done the host uh, host cluster scheduler will schedule this pod onto the uh, nodes. So virtual cluster essentially is a Kubernetes cluster so we can have multiple namespaces and we can have multiple workloads with the same names in it. So does this causes uh, name, uh, naming conflicts as the, both the pod has same name but have the different namespaces and as we are saying uh, vCluster creates all the workload in one namespace. So it should cause an naming conflict but uh, what happens is we cluster before syncing the resource down changes the names so it follows certain pattern so if you have noticed it's a strange name it's a weird name <laughs> but the first part of the name is the uh, name of the resource itself and then the namespace name uh, which is ns1 and then the vc1 is a v cluster name and the v cluster name is appended because you can create n number of virtual cluster inside a same namespace so the so we cluster sinker follows this pattern so you so there is a little chance or no chance to be to have a uh, naming conflict in the host namespace so does the sinker sinks everything down i mean deployment triplica set if it does then what's the use of different virtual cluster right so it does not so sinker on by default only sinks the resources needed by the pod to run like mounted config maps, secrets, PV and PVC services, endpoints. So if, if these things are not there, then pod will not be scheduled onto any node. And it does not sync the higher level resources like deployment, stateful sets, daemon sets and CRDs. So Syncus syncs back, Syncus also syncs back the status from the host cluster object to the virtual uh, respective virtual cluster object to keep it in loop and there are so many other resources which can be synced down uh, by the virtual cluster and those objects can be enabled or disabled by the uh, sync flag or using the uh, vcluster configuration file uh, which is just a values.yaml file if you are familiar with the helm so it's just a helm file helm values file Uh, so another demo just will try to create the workloads here. So now I'm listing a virtual cluster which we created in the last demo. It's the same v cluster we are using again. Now when I do, uh, when I get the pods in that namespace, I'll see uh, two pods, code ENS and VC1. So VC1 is essentially our uh, virtual cluster. Uh, it has two pods, sinker and control plane. Uh, 
and then core DNS is just a core DNS pod to manage the DNS inside virtual cluster. So when I connect to the VC1, uh, now if I do kgate ns, I'll see the new namespaces here and now I'll try to create a deployment here. Okay, create deployment, nginx deploy is the name and image is nginx and the deployment is created. If I get the deployment, I will see it's already ready and available. So the pod is in a running state here. And now I'll disconnect the vCluster and I'll check how the who, uh, what type of pod is created or how the pod is created in the host cluster. So when I list the pod in host cluster namespace, you can see the pod name then the namespace name and then the virtual cluster name. So essentially this is how uh, the pod is synced down to the host cluster. Okay. So vCluster comes with a lots of feature. Uh, so some of the key features are isolation mode. So so when the isolation, uh, all these features can be enabled using values.yaml file or the uh, respective flags. So isolation mode uh, basically creates the resource quota, uh, limit range and the network policies and it applies the pod security standards to, uh, so the workload will be strictly isolated. Then another is uh, rootless mode, uh, it runs the virtual cluster containers such as sing, uh, sinker and the control plane in a non-root mode. Then vCluster can be paused and resume uh, at any time. When it is paused, it scales down the vCluster stateful states or deployment and then delete the workloads created by vCluster and resources be beside PVs are not used in, in, in that state. Then the API server can be exposed by ingress or load balancer and uh, you can install by default, when we created the V cluster, it creates the K3S cluster. So, but you can uh, use any of the following distros K3S, KOS, KHS, and EKS. So, this is a little bit nasty, but you can also install V cluster into V cluster and so on, just making a nested chain there. <laughs> Uh, so, what are the use cases of putting Kubernetes inside Kubernetes? So, one of the use cases which we discussed was multi-tenancy and, and few are like ephemeral CI-CD environment. You can just create and delete the vCluster anytime. It just takes few seconds to create. So, it's a good option for running CI-CDs. Then remote, uh, you can run integration into intents and instant preview environment deployment. Then you can run, uh, you can use it for remote development environments. Uh, you can do experimentation such as trying different version of Kubernetes. And you can write one application and try to run it on like three or four different version of uh, vanilla Kubernetes or EKS or something. And then cluster simulations you can test on it and then it, you can create a multi-tenant cluster in production. And it's also good for demo and training purposes because it is very lightweight. It's very easy to uh, create and destroy. So how should we get started? So it's easy. You just have to go to the vcluster.com, download the binary and create uh, vcluster create and your cluster name. Uh, the documentation is very well written and easy to understand. You can find a vCluster on GitHub and it's open source. So you can also contribute to it. You can test it. You can try to break it and please do break it. So I will improve it. And that's all. So if you have any one question, you can... uh, thank you so much. <laughs> So if anyone has a, any question, can come to the mic and speak in that. Sure. So the resulting pods are they all ending up in a single namespace so that there's no isolation at all? If they 
yeah, need access to their secrets, whatever they, they have access to the mm. whole environment, no? So you, when you create a virtual, virtual cluster and you will give it to the, your user, you basically what you're giving is a cube config access, right? So every tenant will have their own cube config, so they won't be talking with the host cluster API server, so they won't be able to get any resources of the Okay, host so if, API. if the tenant needs more isolation, he can have more weak clusters. Right. Yeah. And Thanks. there is isolation mode, as I said, so it will restrict all the accesses once again. Yeah. Um, are there anything that are not possible to do that you can do if you're running without V cluster on a cluster? Sorry, I didn't. If you have a V cluster, is it anything you cannot do in that cluster as you can do if you have a physical cluster? Oh. Yeah, any limitations there? I suppose there would be some things, but I'm not sure <laughs> if there are because it's just as your regular cluster. And, but I haven't come ac across any use case right now, so I don't have answer to it. But if I get, I will write you back. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe custom resource, custom resource so we are working on the CRD plugin right now. We, we also have a plugin system, so you can write your own custom plugin, which will share across your V clusters. And one of the plugin is uh, syncing your CRDs to the host cluster. Yeah, we are trying to cover everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hi. Any hi. chance to have it as a not 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 as a CLI, but as an operator, basically have CRDs to create virtual clusters, basically? Uh, we install it via Helm charts. So basically, uh, CLI is just it's very lightweight. But I'm not sure why do you want it to be operator? Well, basically, so. People can define virtual clusters in a CRD in a definition, basically, and they can use GitOps or something like that right. in order to sort of deploy. For example, in CI/CD, I can get the idea of using the CLI, probably fine. Mm -hmm. But if you have like maybe more complicated authorization or authentication structure or something like that, I don't know. Sometimes it's useful to have that syncer as being basically looking at CRDs in the host and then trying to create virtual clusters, but. It's just another interface. So. so, if you want to customize the installation part of vCluster, there are so many options. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm also sure uh, what you want for your use case are also options in uh, configurable, which you can do using values file. So, yeah, basically. Mm -hmm. So if you have any more questions, you can write me at my email address. Thank you. Thank you.